Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Nicholas Christakis, the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale University. He's a sociologist and physician known for his research on social networks and on the socioeconomic, biosocial and evolutionary determinants of behavior, health and longevity. And today we're going to focus our conversation on his most recent book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Dr. Chris Takis, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you so much for having me. Call me Nicholas. Okay, I will try. I will try. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I found your book very interesting. I've already had several evolutionary psychologists on the show, for example. And, I mean, one of the things that you talk about here is uh, there is a social suite. I mean, eight different things that you refer to. I'm just going to go quickly through them. The capacity to have and recognize individual identity, love for parents and offspring, friendship, social networks, cooperation, in-group bias, mild hierarchy, and social learning and teaching. So are these eight aspects, do we know if they are really a part of a, a universal human nature, that, that is, are they part uh, all people throughout the globe possess these kinds of uh, psychological traits? Yeah, so just to emphasize, the, the, the qualities that interest me and that you listed are qualities that we humans manifest between ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there are many parts of human nature that we can express, that have been shaped by natural selection, and that we can express independently. For example, uh, risk tolerance or risk aversion, for example, or religiosity. You know, we're equipped with brains that can imagine supernatural forces, but you can do that on your own. You know, you can be a hermit up in a mountain, for example, or bravery. You know, you're, you're, uh, a, you can be brave with respect to forces of nature, you know, with respect to wild animals or snowstorms, for example. But the qualities that I'm interested in are qualities that require the presence of other people, those parts of our nature that relate to how we interact with each other. So we don't think of your capacity to love yourself. We think about the love of other people or to befriend yourself. We think about friendships with other people or hierarchy. Hierarchy is not a quality that uh, inheres in a single individual. It's a quality of a collection of individuals or teaching. You can learn things on your own, but we think of teaching other people things or cooperation. You don't cooperate with yourself. You cooperate with other people. So the qualities that you listed are features of our nature that require other people to be present. And natural selection has shaped how we interact with other people in these beneficent ways. And, and they're all good. Mostly they're all good, the qualities that I list. Uh, and, and that's rather deliberate as well, because in my view, for too long, the scientific community and people on the street have been overly focused on the dark side of our nature, yeah. on our propensity for selfishness or, or tribalism or, or violence or cruelty. And I think the bright side has been denied the attention it deserves, our, our capacity for love and friendship and cooperation and teaching. And I would argue that these forces are actually more powerful than the forces for evil because, because if every time I came near you, you filled me with lies, you know, you told me falsehoods about the environment, or you were mean to me, or you killed me, I would be better off living as an isolated individual. But we don't live as isolated individuals. We live in, in groups. And so the benefits of a connected life must have outweighed the costs. And it's those benefits that you listed there uh, about a connected life that I that I highlight, mm -hmm. and these qualities are part of all human societies, at least that we know of, right? Because yes. uh, we can introduce here the topic of human universals that. Uh, for some people at least is a bit controversial because when we look into other societies it's easier for us to find uh, diversity or variability instead of the underlying aspects that are part of our common humanity. Right. Yes, so first of all I would say that these 
first of all, it's clear they're universals of many kinds. But um, but first of all, I would say that um, that uh, these universals are capacities. They're not necessarily always expressed. So, mm -hmm. for example, thinking about an individual body, not thinking now about a, a social group, just thinking about a body, you can have the, there's a universal presence in human beings for uh, a pancreas that works in a certain way. But if I if I starve you or if I overfeed you, I can derange the course of the, the expression of that functionality within the pancreas. You know, I can give you diabetes, for example, or you might have a certain propensity to be a certain height. But if I starve you, your growth will be stunted. So even though we have these good capacities that for living together that we just discussed universally, there can be environmental or cultural forces that constrain those capacities. But I would argue that stunted societies are no more an illustration of our, to, of our true propensity to make a good society than stunted bodies are an illustration of our innate capacity to make particular kinds of bodies. So, so yes, these are universal. Now, having said that, it's also obviously the case that, that there are a great variety of ways of living. There's enormous variation culturally across societies. In fact, in, in a kind of sleight of hand that I do in the book, I argue that this very capacity for cultural variation is universal. That is to say, teaching, the fact that we teach each other things, which is very unusual in the animal kingdom. You know, basically all animals can learn. A little fish in the sea can learn that if it swims up to the light, it will find food. And, and some animals learn socially. So for example, you put your hand in the fire and you learn that it burns. That's you learned independently. Or I can watch you put your hand in the fire and I gain almost as much knowledge, but pay none of the price. That's incredibly efficient, that kind of social learning. Or you eat a red berry and you die, and then I see you eat the red berry, and so I don't either. That's super efficient. But we don't just learn socially, we teach each other things. We set out to teach each other things. This is universal in us, but extremely rare in the animal kingdom. And it's this capacity to teach each other things that actually is also at the core of the variation, the cultural variation we see around the world. So I'll finish in a second. So when we, when you go around the world, you, you know, people, anyone who's traveled is immediately struck by all oh, the people here, the food smells different and the people dress differently and they worship different gods and they have a different political system. And there's so many things that we immediately notice that are different around the world. But once you spend time with these people, you also see the things that are so the same are that they love their families. They have friends. They work together. They teach each other things. It's these universal qualities that interest me. And I think they're much more fundamental than any superficial differences among us. Mm -hmm. And these capacities that you were just referring to, like, for example, learning uh, and also probably things like language and culture and things like that. I mean, they also have to have an evolutionary and genetic basis for us, for us to be able to, uh, I mean, to do those kinds of things, to teach other people, to learn, to yes. acquire culture, to have cumulative culture, because otherwise, if other animals were exposed, let's say, to the same environment, like, for example, our pets, then they would also probably be able to do that, right? Yeah, so that's right. So our capacity for culture and to accumulate culture also reflects the workings of, of natural selection in shaping us to be social animals. I mean, I, um, animals that have culture are animals that live together and can transmit the knowledge from one person to one, one, one animal to another animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And going back just very quickly to the social suite, there are things there that we 
tend to think as being parochial or tribal uh, or, I mean, for example, things like in-group bias, friendship, family, relationships. But isn't it the case that even those things were the ones that, because we needed them, it was through them that we were able to develop or to evolve certain uh, emotions that now we can expand to progressively include other people in our uh, social environment in, and even in our moral circle, let's say. Yeah, so there's a lot in your question. Uh, first, there are, there are uh, features of the social suite that tend to constrain our social worlds. And for example, the capacity for friendship or the capacity to draw distinctions between groups, sometimes arbitrary distinctions, and to prefer our own group to other groups, mm -hmm. those definitely evolved to, to, uh, to, um, to, to constrain the scale of our social interactions in, in ways that uh, are theorized to have made it possible for us to cooperate. So, so for example, um, uh, hold on, let me just make a note so I can remember when I go off on this uh, uh, tangent, I can come back. So, so imagine, uh, imagine just as a toy example, I told you that you were in a group of a thousand people and your challenge was to cooperate with everyone else. So, so I, I go to an, you as an individual, I say, you're in a group of a thousand, cooperate with everyone. And you're like, it's impossible for me to cooperate. Too many people are making demands on me. Uh, I can't remember who's who, it's too big a group. If I cooperate with one person, I might never see them again, so they'll never be able to reciprocate. It's too large. Mm -hmm. So natural selection, but, but if cooperate, so, so therefore as a result in that population of a thousand, nobody cooperates with anyone and there's no cooperation in the population. Well, if natural selection could find a way to solve that problem, we might be able to get more cooperation, which would be good for everyone in the group. One of the ways that natural selection does this is by equipping us with this preference for in, it's theorized, is, in, in, is equipping us with this preference for in-group bias. So imagine now I take this group of a thousand and I divide them into 10 groups of a hundred and I give them flags with different colors, you know, uh, green and blue and purple, for example. And I tell everyone, just cooperate with the people that are holding a flag with your color. And so now, you know, the purples, look around, oh, I'll just cooperate with the purples. And the blues look around and say, I'll just cooperate with the blues. And as a result of this now, the scale, this is known as adding structure to the population. You've, you've, you've added structure to this population of a thousand that previously was am amorphous. And having added that structure, now you, everyone has a simpler problem. You just have to cooperate with people holding your flag color. And, uh, and when you do that, uh, now everyone is more willing and able to cooperate. And now if we look at the population of a thousand, we see a lot more co cooperation in the system. An alternative way that, but similar, an alternative but similar way that natural selection has addressed the problem of how to support cooperation is to, and by adding structure, is to endow us with the capacity to have friends. So now in this group of a thousand, everyone has let's say four or five or six friends. You create a network and you tell every person, look, you don't have to cooperate with all thousand people, just cooperate with your friends. And so now once again, oh, I can cooperate with my friends. I just have a few friends. And now once again, you get a lot more cooperation. So this is another way of adding structure to the population. And it is felt that these capacities for friendship and separately in-group bias co-evolved with our capacity for cooperation and that all of these tools have been useful to us in our evolutionary past in working together to live socially effectively. Now, as you said, there, there, is, there are arguments being made, which I think are probably true, that, that over time, human beings have been expanding their social sphere. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the sweep of our evolution, and I discussed this in Blueprint, you know, it's, it's probably the case that the first kind of ego alter from one person to another person, ego alter kind of concern was probably between parents and children, right? Like your investment and cooperation with your children enhances your Darwinian fitness. In some animals, this eventually expanded to between members of the same 
couple, for example, in the form of monogamy. Here I'm talking about social monogamy, uh, you know, where, where a pair of animals like might mate for life, for example. Birds do this, certain mammals do this, we do it typically. Um, I'm not talking about sexual fidelity or sexual monogamy. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, so, 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 uh, so then our circle might have expanded from our offspring to include our partners and then family units. There are some theories I think likely true that then having, having had this infrastructure to be concerned about others, we began to think about our friends and our groups that way. And then groups, you know, the concern expanded. And I think what we're seeing now, mostly for cultural reasons, some people would argue, like E.O. Wilson, over hundreds of thousands of years, that we might also see this for genetic reasons, that our circle of concern is expanding, for example, to include very large numbers, eventually perhaps to include every human on the planet. So I might say, I'm concerned about all people. I'll be nice to all people. So... I don't think of these things as parochial. Uh, I think of these as tools that we have, that we've evolved to care about each other and that can be deployed in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But do you agree when some people say that, for example, uh, our innate capacities, let's say some of our psychological mechanisms that we have evolved uh, because we now live in societies and environments that are very different from the ones we evolved in. I mean, our modern technological, yes. very, very big societies with millions and millions of people that there could be a case for evolutionary mismatch there in terms of there being a limit for us as individuals or as communities to expand our moral concerns concern for other people, for example. Yeah, I think there could be an evolutionary mismatch, but there's another topic that's discussed in the book known as gene culture coevolution, which is the idea that as we change our cultural environment, we change our evolutionary trajectory. So I think that as we build political systems, as we have built over the last 10,000 years, diverse sorts of political systems, we may evolve uh, to be a more fit for those systems. Most of the arguments in the book pertain to, uh, you know, our evolution over 300,000 years and, and things that we're talking about could apply to human beings, you know, who were pre-political, let's say up, you know, 10,000 years ago. Um, but let's, let's go on a little tangent and talk about gene culture coevolution because it's relevant to your question. Uh, it's clear that our natural evolution and our cultural evolution, you know, culture evolves and changes are in conversation with each other. And the best example we have of this is the evolution of, uh, of lactase persistence in adulthood. That is to say, the ability of adults to digest milk, which is seen in about half of the world's population today. So if you think about it, about 10,000 years ago, up until about 10,000 years ago, uh, the, only, the only time in our lives when we could digest milk was when we were babies. We had an enzyme in our bodies called lactase, which could digest the principal sugar in milk, which is called lactose. And, uh, and babies could digest milk because they were, you know, drinking milk from their mother's breast. And then when they were weaned, they lost this capacity. The lactase disappeared, basically was no longer active or available. And, uh, and this made perfect sense because no adult ever drank milk because there was no milk in the environment. In other words, up until about 10,000 years ago, only babies ever had the opportunity to drink milk, and there was no reason for adults to be able to, to drink milk. Well, what happened? Multiple times between 3,000 and 9,000 years ago, human beings, because of teaching, because of cultural and technological innovations, domesticated milk-producing animals. We domesticated goats and sheep and cattle and camels, for example, and now suddenly, because of our intervention into the, our cultural innovation and our intervention into the world, around us in the environment, there was milk. So humans that happened to have mutations that made it possible for them to continue to digest milk into adulthood, they did better because they had another source of food that no one else could eat, or they had a source of clean hydration if the water was spoiled. So this, these mutations that allowed you to digest milk into adulthood, uh, 
were very useful and successful and spread throughout the po population of humans such that most humans nowadays can digest milk, uh, you know, about half the world population. It was a very useful mutation. So uh, this is the best worked out example, but there are many examples and they're very dramatic and interesting. I think it's possible that our invention of cities about 8,000 years ago was another innovation like that. I think humans might be smarter today than they would have been had we not invented cities because the kinds of brains required to live in a world where there are cities are different than the kinds of brains required to live in a world where there are not cities. I'm not saying that urban people are smarter than rural people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in a world in which there are cities, this changes the course of our evolution. And so finally, your question about political systems, I think it's possible that as we have invented more complex political systems over the last few thousand years, that in the coming few thousand, this, this doesn't work fast, this effect, it takes, let's say, at least a couple thousand years, I think it's possible that, that we will have changed the course of our evolution. You know, climate change, we're changing the world through climate change, that's going to change the course of human evolution too. So there are many things we do to our environment because of our culture that uh, affects our evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, in studying human sociality, you, for example, perform lab experiments, but then we also have natural experiments, or at least what we could call that. Like, for example, in your book, you talk about shipwrecks and intentional communities. So focusing on the intentional communities, because I found them, I find them very amusing. They have been popping up several times during the last uh, few centuries, let's say. So, I mean, they are aspects where they succeed and others where they fail. What can we learn from the kinds of experiments that people do on those communities? Well, I mean, okay, so if so, you know, here we've been discussing what kind of social order comes naturally to us, right? Like what kind of social organization are humans naturally predisposed to make? And so if you were if you were a really good scientist, or I suppose if you were a mad scientist, what you'd love to do to test this idea is take a group of babies who'd never been exposed to any culture and isolate them on a faraway island. Uh, and see, you know, somehow feed them and let them grow up miraculously, and then come back and see, well, what kind of society, you know, what kind of social order did they make for themselves? Now, obviously, you couldn't do this experiment. It's cruel and unethical. Um, and it's been called the forbidden experiment. But this hasn't stopped powerful rulers for thousands of years of thinking about this experiment, and in some cases, doing a variant of this experiment. So, for example, Samtik I, an Egyptian pharaoh, Herodotus tells us, was very curious as, as about what kind of language comes naturally to humans. And so he and other monarchs in the future typically did a variant of the experiment where they took a couple of babies and gave them to uh, a mute shepherd to raise up in the mountains to see, you know, what kind of language did those uh, babies speak when they grew up. Now, obviously, we can't do this experiment. So I was looking for natural experiments that might, you know, with limitations approximate that. You mentioned one, one was shipwrecks, groups of people thrown together who, you know, had to make some kind of society for a while. And another was these intentional communities. Human beings, we have records since Roman times have been, you have, you have been saying, you know, society screwed up and, and they've just sort of, you know, left and gone off into the wilderness to make their own society. And in the United States, where there was a, during the 19th century, there were thousands of these communes that were set up. Also during the 20th century, during the 1960s, uh, Israeli kibbutzes during the 1960s, and other intentional communities like, like, like submarine uh, crews, you know, nuclear submarines, or, uh, or um, uh, scientists who spend the, the winter in the South Pole and are stuck there for 10 months. No one comes or goes. So I looked at all of these examples to try to see Are there reproducible? And, and also, as you alluded to, I looked at online worlds, and we also did experiments in my laboratory. We, we have a kind of software that allows us to create temporary artificial societies of real people. Over 30,000 people have come into our online lab, and we, in this kind of godlike way, have manipulated you know, the social organization to see what kind of social organization is most conducive to a healthy social life in these populations. And across all of these examples, 
I concluded that basically there was only one way of being social, that if we are to come together and live as a social organism, there is one optimal way of doing that. And, uh, and it includes the elements of the social suite. And furthermore, in circumstances in which we are, for whatever reason, unable to instantiate those capacities, you know, to realize those capacities, that spells failure. So shipwrecks, for example, or communes that, um, that are, uh, you know, that, that attempt to suppress friendship or that uh, attempt to suppress love of partners, for example, um, or that attempt to suppress all hierarchy or that are too hierarchical, these fail. They are not able to, um, to succeed in living socially. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, but let me just ask you a follow-up question. So, I mean, particularly in political philosophy, there has always been this question about the interplay between the individual and the collective, right? Because, I mean, it's really hard for us to think about human societies in terms of what is more important, if it is the collective or the individual, and to what extent we must respect individuals and individual variability. So uh, the first aspect that you point to in the social suite is the capacity to have and recognize individual identity. Is it the case that the intentional communities, for example, that were most successful were the ones that also allowed for a certain degree of flexibility in terms of how people could behave and, to, and allowed for them to express their own individual traits in some way? Yes, that is true. So, so this, this capacity for identity, if you think about it, for a pancreas to do its job, or a kidney to do its job, all kidneys and all pancreases that are doing their job should function the same way, should be the same. But for a human face to do its job, it has to be different. Every human face is different from every other human face. This is an evolutionary luxury. The fact that we evolve, we don't all have the same face. The fact that we all have a different faces has evolved because natural selection has been um, has shaped us to have this capacity to be unique individuals and to communicate signal our uniqueness. And furthermore, we have the capacity. A lot of our brain is devoted to telling the difference from faces, one face from another. So we recognize these signals. Well, why? Well, one of the deep ironies of living socially is that we first must be individuals. If, if you don't want someone else to forget that they've had sex with you, or you don't want someone to raise, take care of a different child and neglect you who are their own child, or if you want people to remember that you've been kind to them so they can reciprocate the kindness, well, then it's very useful to have a way to say, this is me, not someone else. So it's, we are unusual as animals in our ability to signal and detect our individual identity, as you've been highlighting. Now, societies that try to suppress the social suite, which includes identity and love, which I'll talk both about now, Communes that try to do that typically fail. So communes that, for example, require everyone to dress in an identical way or to suppress their individuality completely. I mean, you can dress, and there are many successful communes, in fact, that do dress in an identical way. But, but if, if you carry that too far and you require people to, to suppress their individual identity, don't work. And I discuss some examples of that in the book. But but I'd also like to highlight this notion of love because, because the, the family unit and the attachment that people feel to their children and partners or to their intimate friends is a threat to collective identity. So authoritarian governments typically try to suppress the family unit and some communes have tried to suppress it. And sometimes they've gone in very opposite directions. So for example, you have the shakers, which prohibits sex completely between people. And you have other communes which have polyamory, which say everyone can have sex with everyone else. Now, these are very opposite behaviors, but actually they're both attempting to address the same problem, which is that we in the commune don't want, we want you to feel attached to the whole group. We don't want you to feel a special attachment, you know, just to your partner or your children. So communal child rearing has also been attempted multiple times, always has failed, um, because 
partly it's often done to to give women put them on equal footing to men so they don't have special burdens of child caring rearing but also sometimes it's been attempted and even plato talks about this in order to subvert your connections between parents and children so everyone feels a commitment to the whole society this also doesn't work it's it's very difficult in fact it's impossible to suppress love or identity for a very long time so so yes i think those communes or those communitarian movements are in the limit those authoritarian regimes that try to work against these fundamental innate qualities of social order ultimately they may succeed for a while but they ultimately fail mm -hmm. so we've been talking about different aspects about our evolved psychology culture and you also highlighted the mechanism of gene culture coevolution so uh, do you have any take on that discussion that, that has been very prevalent in psychology about nature versus nurture i mean are you in any way for example an interactionist when it comes to that or do you lean more toward nature no no both are both are crucially important uh, in virtually every human trait, both nature and nurture play an important role. Um, and I, I think it's, I think more interesting questions have to do with how they interact or the extent to which each is relevant in any particular domain, not trying to make some kind of summary judgment about which is which. Um, I mean, both are obviously important in human affairs. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, uh, I, I mean, perhaps we could look at the question uh, regarding two different uh, time scales, for example, if we are talking about the life of a particular individual since its birth during uh, its development and things like that, maybe someone is exposed to a particular culture and that might have uh, might influence how she develops. But then, perhaps when we are referring to mechanisms like gene culture coevolution, because we are talking about uh, bigger stretches of time, then what could happen is that we create environments where we live that also create new uh, evolutionary pressures that we are exposed to and that has a direct effect on genetic evolution, right? So th those are two different types of... Yeah, but, it's, but both are important on both time scales. So, you know, we know, for example, from identical twins raised apart studies that, you know, there's only so much that culture can divert, even in the life of a given individual. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's had more than one child knows that some children are just born different than other children. You know, they have temperaments, they, they have capacities, they have interests. Uh, so no matter what you do, you know, this child is musical and this child is not. Now, obviously, you get a perfect storm when you get a Mozart. You know, you get someone with musical ability and a father who can teach him, and then you get, you know, Mozart. But, um, but no, I think both are important in, in all timescales, actually. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the kinds of questions that you explored in your book could also give us insights into uh, current issues that we are living now, like, for example, uh, things regarding political polarization? Well... Um, I think there are a number of challenges that we face, political polarization, um, you know, the sort of the rise, the global rise of populism, I think, reflects some um, inborn traits that humans have. I think climate change, you know, the way we the way we fail to work together or the way we do work together will be relevant to climate change. I think how we confront the the introduction of artificial intelligence into our social systems, something I also talk about, I think that will uh, some of the ideas in the book will be highly relevant. So I think there are a variety of challenges, that political challenges, technological challenges, social challenges that we are facing in the world today that a deeper understanding of our nature can shed light on. Uh, on, the, on the political polarization, you know, uh, let me sort of tell you a, a kind of a toy example. Imagine you have a thousand people again and uh and and they're arbitrarily partitioned into groups once again and these groups are defined by you know what sports teams they like or occupations or skin color or religion or immigrant status or whatever arbitrary thing that human beings 
you know, will privilege, you know, language, religion, etc. And uh, and now you go to this group and you and they're polarized. They're struggling. How how can you confront that problem? Well, one way you can confront the problem is to move up a level. Uh, and this is this is the uh, this has been a part of American history certainly for a long time. And Alexis de Tocqueville writes about this that in the United States we have this notion that anyone can be an American. You know that the American experiment is about accepting, let's say, a certain the Bill of Rights and a certain set of political liberal principles, and then it doesn't matter if you're Greek or Japanese or Italian or whatever you are, and you immigrate to the United States, you can be an American, which is actually kind of rare around the world. You know, other societies aren't as open as we are. And uh, okay, so what what effectively what effectively you're doing there is you're taking advantage of this capacity we have to draw arbitrary boundaries between us and them and to feel a kind of kinship for our group, you move up a level. So one solution to polarization is to go up a level and say, okay, we're all, let's say, American. Or earlier, as we were saying, we're all human beings. Okay, in a fantasy, eventually, we might be able to do that. But another approach is to go down a level and to take advantage of our capacity for individual identity, like we were talking about earlier, and to see each person as a unique human being, not as a member of some group, so I don't define you by saying, oh, you know, you're a middle-aged Greek American man and therefore you believe this. Instead, I just say, well, who are you and what are your beliefs and can I relate to you as a unique human being? And actually, this has also been part of the tradition in the United States. So when Martin Luther King argues that he looked forward to the time when the, his children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character, he's moving down a level. He's saying people should be judged based on who they are as individuals. And you see, we have this capacity. So we can use this capacity to contact, to counteract polarization by looking at other people as unique individuals with their own path in life and their own beliefs, not defined, let's say, by their group membership. So, so I think these, these capacities we have been endowed with in the social suite these capacities to for friendship, for cooperation, for identity, for the arbitrary definition of group boundaries, give us the tools we need to address the problem of polarization that you've identified. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes maybe the best solution is for us to move up one level and other times to move down one or several levels. Because, I mean, when we talk about political polarization, many people say that the best solution is just for us to create a broader, more encompassing identity to include more and more yes. people. But sometimes maybe it's better to break that down and to look at people at the individual level as individuals. Yes, because if you think about the North Koreans, they don't have any polarization in their society, at least that we can discern. And they've achieved that by, by a totalitarian kind of suppression of individual identity, of uh, familial, you know, kind of loyalty, uh, you know, that is not sustainable long term and is not desirable either, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, both tools are available to us. In the book, I talk about some examples where scientists have experimentally done both of these things, including go up a level. There's a famous demonstration called the um, robber's cave, for God's sakes. It's a very famous experiment by a Turkish-American social psychologist that was done in the 1950s, so Muzaffer Sharif, and uh, it was called the Robber's Cave Demonstration. And what he did in that ex demonstration is he took groups of 11-year-old boys and he uh, put them in a camp, in a summer camp, and he cultivated it in two different groups, and he cultivated a, a groupy identity within each group. And then in the latter part of the demonstration, he contrived to have like a threat to the entire camp. And then the groups bonded together and forgot about their previous divisions to confront the water shortage that affected them all. This is like the trope in science fiction, you know, the alien invasion and all human beings now band together to fight the aliens, you know, like an Independence Day uh, with Will Smith, uh, one of my favorite science fiction movies. But anyway, uh, you know, that is, um, you know, that is a common um, response or common strategy to get groups and some people feel, I think correctly, 
that one of the reasons we have more polarization in the United States today than we did 20 years ago reflects in part the, uh, the fall, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because, you know, when the Soviet Union was, was super powerful and was seen by all Americans as like an external threat, uh, you know, there was more, let's say, solidarity among Americans. But, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, I think Americans, let's say, had more time and more opportunity to have petty arguments among themselves. So I think this rise in polarization in the United States may in part reflect those geopolitical uh, changes. And I wonder whether with the, with the rise of China, whether we will see over the coming generation uh, a kind of um, a decline actually in polarization in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Christakis, we are reaching our time limit. So just very, very quickly before we go, apart from your book, would you like to tell people what are the best places on the internet for them to find your work? Oh, well, I mean, I have a, my website is humannaturelab.net, humannaturelab.net. And uh, also you can find me at nicholaschristakis.net. Um, so, and all of our scientific papers and videos about our work and other talks are all available uh, at, at my website. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. Uh, I love the book, so I recommend it to all my listeners and viewers. And Dr. Chris Takis, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure and good luck with your interviews and, and, the, and this podcast, which I really enjoyed. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Heninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jakob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart. My three producers is our web, Rosie and Jim Frank, and my executive producer, Mikal Ruzieski. Thank you for all.